And this dynamic here really comes through here where you just you can't be bothered interacting or engaging with him as though you are both equals who have an equal say in your marriage. And that's not healthy and that's uh, that's also not good. And I think it in many ways is emasculating for the man. And that's a big part of why when they don't feel respected, then they go ahead and do whatever the F they want anyway, because they're grown adult men and they can also make their own decisions. So that's not good. Welcome to Mom Alternative. Today is all about masculinity and what we consider to be normal or abnormal behavior for a man. We'll be talking about teaching your son to be stoic as a six month old. When does making a conversation become a creepy encounter? A husband buying things without permission and not celebrating Valentine's Day with your spouse. Our first one is titled Husband Says Groundwork is Laid for Our Son to Be a Sissy. I will preface this by saying that my husband and I are very much on the same page with parenting. We've talked extensively about it prior to having children and more so now that we have our son. I know this is very long. Lately, our son, who's six and a half months, has been kind of whiny. The other day, as I was sitting him in his high chair to feed him dinner, I said something along the lines of, man, kiddo, your whining is kind of going right through me today. I'm not sure what you want. Can you use your big boy words and just help your mama out? Clearly, I know he can't talk. I know babies whine just to whine or because they can't communicate what they need. However, it's really bothering my husband more than me lately. Our son has belly issues. And he screams when he has to pass gas until the gas actually comes out. Then he's back to being super happy or if it's nighttime, he'll go right back to sleep. He'll wake up in the middle of the night multiple times because he has to fart and it hurts his belly. So the only way to help him is to pick him up while he screams or cries until he finally passes gas. Either that or I will attempt a side life feed to help him relax enough until he farts. This has been happening since we came home from the hospital after he was born. I have tried everything to help him. Nothing has worked. It's a wait until the they grow out of it scenario. My husband hurt his arm at the beginning of December and can't lift anything more than one pound, meaning he's been off work since December, home all day, every day with us, but I've been doing all of everything for our son. He'll play with him, sit with him, sometimes feed solids, but everything from nighttime feeds, consoling to day-to-day -day things are done by me because he can't lift or use his arm. I'm a stay-at-home mom and he would be working full-time if he didn't hurt himself. When I walk out of the room, our babe will sometimes start whining or crying because I left. Or sometimes he's just whining because I don't know why, I guess, just because he's a baby. But my husband made the comment tonight that he feels like the groundwork has been laid for our son to be a sissy, mainly because I cater to him so much and because he feels our son doesn't take to him very well at times. We calmly talked about it and I said I have done every diaper change, clothing change, playtime, bedtime, book reading, bath time, nap time, and middle of the night consoling since December. But most importantly, I have fed this child from my own body from conception until now because we exclusively breastfeed. So someone, anyone, my husband, mother-in-law, cousin, or my own mother making a negative comment that my child is a mama's boy or that he will have separation anxiety is a slap in the face to me. I'm doing my best to be the best mom to my baby boy. I will leave him alone in another room. I can still see him. He can't see me. So he can be away from me for a while so I can do dishes or clean the kitchen or put laundry away specifically so he can start to realize that mama walked away, but she will be back. It's okay. I will purposely eat standing up in the kitchen for meals out of his line of vision just so, he can, just so he's away from me and will play by himself. I don't know. It just really hurt my heart to hear my own husband say that. We've always wanted to raise strong, independent children, and I don't think I've laid the groundwork for him to be a sissy. He's six months old. Mama will always be there for him. I'm just sad tonight. Thanks for reading. Ah... Now, you know what's really funny about this is I do think that it makes it very clear to me why you need two parents uh, and ideally why you need two biological parents who are of the opposite gender when it comes to raising kids because men and women just respond to kids in slightly different ways and see different things. Uh, I do think that there is a definite part of this where the husband is kind of overreacting. Um, I did a the previous segment about this idea of raising a stoic child and there was a story about a three-year-old, I think it was a three-year-old uh, toddler who was not stoic at all, who was crying all the time and so on. And yeah, I can totally see that when you have a three-year-old um, child and they have these ingrained habits that you want to get them out of, you can make a comment like this. You can kind of say, hey, um, the whining is really getting too much. We, we need to do something about that. And fair enough, uh, at that 
that age, I would also say that's a, that's a pretty foundational age in terms of teaching kids emotional regulation. A six month old baby is not there yet. It's not there yet. Uh, I think that this part of the baby whining when you walk out of the room, like as often that happens uh, f for us, for example, with, uh, with our son, it happens with both parents because he's, he's spent pretty a lot, a lot of time with both of us. And so sometimes if he wants to interact with someone or if he wants to play with someone or if he's trying to like engage with you and you walk away from him, he gets upset. And that's, he only has so many ways to express that he's upset. And with babies, the only way they have to express that they're upset are with babbling or with whining or with crying. Like that's pretty much the variety of noises that a child is able to make. And so I think the husband here is completely overreacting. Uh, yes, I totally understand the point that as a man, he does not want to see his son be a, like a whiny crybaby type of son. Uh, and I, I understand where that's coming from. As a, as a mother, I also wouldn't want to see my son be like that. But, um, but you don't need to start freaking out about that quite so early. It does sound to me like he's a little bit frustrated at the fact that he's not as engaged with the child as he should be because of his injury. And under those circumstances, I kind of say, you know what, you just wait it out. You wait out a couple of months. Uh, you you have so much time to fix any potential behavioral problems that you see in your son. To teach him how to regulate his emotions differently, to teach him how to express himself differently. You do not need to already start at seven months saying, "Oh my god." And then here for the mother, uh, if I were OP, I would probably say something along the lines of, "Of course, young babies, like infant children." will always be dependent on their mothers to a very different extent uh, when it comes to how they interact with their dads. Like you cannot compare these two things, especially if you're breastfeeding. Yes, uh, the baby will associate you with food, with comfort. Uh, yes, you do wake up at night with him much more often. So he has that association there. It's just, it's just biology. It's just part of life. And as they grow up, then that connection between mother and child starts kind of I don't want to say it, it starts loosening a little bit, but it's definitely no longer biological to the same extent that it is at the beginning. And so it's kind of one of those areas where, yeah, okay, you can take it as a personal insult. And honestly, I hate the implication that I, as a mother, am, uh, I'm holding my son back from being independent, from exploring things by himself and so on because of my personal needs as a mother. Like I'm, I'm trying to force him to be attached to me. I really hate the suggestion of that because it implies that you're very selfish uh, as the mother that is, and you are more concerned for your own needs than you are concerned for your child's. And that's, that's obviously not good. Uh, that's not how any of us want to parent. So I understand being annoyed. I understand being frustrated. And I think it's good that you were able to sit down, have a conversation about it. And that if your husband noticed that he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm not super comfortable with how this is developing that you could sit down and go okay uh maybe he has a point maybe he doesn't have a point and you had an adult conversation about it i think that's good but i would say for op don't overthink it uh, people i think a lot of people make these types of comments just because they think it's like cute uh sometimes people will mention it because they want to um kind of encourage you as a mother they're like oh look he's such a mama's boy uh, and it's meant to be it's meant to show you that he likes you and that they notice that he really likes you uh, and so you don't need to take it as kind of a personal judgment of how you are doing as a parent a six-month-old baby will always be a lot more dependent on their mother than otherwise and that's just completely normal uh, but i totally understand where the dad is coming from and i think it's good that he that he noted it now a couple of uh, example responses here let me start by saying your husband is wrong you aren't laying the groundwork for the baby to be a sissy now my thoughts they're just starting to get their personalities now and i can tell you from my first from my first one, that very little I did had an effect on her. They're going to develop into who they are, regardless of how attached to you they are now. My first was very attached to me and now is a daddy's girl. What I'm trying to say is don't stress out about the little things above, like eating out of his sight, etc. While it's good thinking, he will figure out all of that, that mama does come back without your direct effort. The fact you're even thinking through these things means your baby will be just fine. Follow your instincts, but don't overstress about the little things. My guess is the issue your husband... The issue is that your husband feels slightly rejected by the baby, whether he's admitting it to you or himself. When babies have an obvious parent preference, it can be tough, especially when both are around equally. Luckily, the parent preference ebbs and flows, and I'm sure this phase will be long forgotten when your little guy is standing in the doorway jumping for dad when he gets home. This season is so short. I hope you can let his comment roll off you and feel confident that you're doing a great job. I really like this comment because she picked up on this idea of... Um, it's just just the mother's really trying to make herself uncomfortable in some ways to try and teach the kid to be independent. 
And I honestly believe that so long as you don't allow having kids to interfere with your ability to do things in, in life in general, so things like doing laundry, uh, if you want to do some kind of work um, that you're able to work, you know, for a reasonable amount of time, wh whatever it is that's simple, if you want to go for a walk, if you want to take the dog outside, whatever it is you want to do, if you don't let having a child interfere with these things and you find ways to either take your child with you or to just have him coexist kind of next to you and let him play by himself and, and, and occupy himself, then you're not going to end up in this situation where kids are overly dependent on you. I really think that over-dependence, over-attachment only properly happens if you prevent them from doing their own things, from exploring the way that they want to, the way that they have a natural inclination to, because you want to keep them by yourself. That's the helicopter parenting style of parenting. Uh, and so, yeah, you don't, you don't need to be eating, standing in the kitchen, really uncomfortably just so you you can he doesn't see you and doesn't realize you know it starts learning that you're going to come back if he can't see you for a little bit i think this is completely over the top you don't need to go quite that far uh, the next one, the whining is totally on point for his development. I always worried with my first, he's a boy now, almost five, that I was coddling him. But since he started school, one of the biggest compliments I get from all of his teachers and staff is that he's so empathetic and kind while being a boy's boy. He roughhouses and plays and keeps up with all the boys, but has the capability to be gentle with the girls. This might ruffle feathers nowadays, but my husband is a man's man. I'm talking hunting, fishing, sports, car mechanics, everything. But even he knows that our boy is only four years old and I've heard him encourage our son to shed some tears if need be, but then pick himself up and keep going, whatever the situation may be. There's nothing wrong with him being a mama's boy. I have a dirt eating, baseball playing, ripped jeans from falling, climbing, fighting boy that knows his mama will always be behind. You're doing a great job. And like a previous post I said, maybe dad is feeling a little rejected, but tell him his time is coming and that little boy is going to stick in him like gum. I guess stick to him like gum because sticking in him is not quite the point but I really appreciated here this idea of like a man's man and the way that you describe a man's man is with these kind of traditionally masculine hobbies like hunting fishing uh, being interested in sports and cars and mechanics uh, and yeah I mean I, I don't believe that that's uh, especially controversial I think that yes there is a fundamental difference here a natural difference if you will between boys and girls and their interests and between men and women and their interests um, which isn't to say that there aren't girls who are interested in those things and there aren't boys who are interested in more feminine things but it's fair enough <laughs> to say that uh, that boys develop you know at their own pace uh, and at their own age and sometimes their interests develop in different directions as well and this is kind of fundamental it goes back to the original point of this is why having a father involved in a child's life makes such a big difference because they do get exposure to a much broader set of interests than they probably would otherwise if they only ever interacted with a female uh, role model or a female parental figure. So yeah, uh, in general, for all people out there, you do not need to start freaking out that your son is going to be a baby forever just because as a six-month-old, he interacts in the only ways that six-month-old babies are able to interact. Uh, and uh, masculinity in general, in terms of stoicism and interest in masculine things, uh, are things that you can develop over time and you just need a good role model and someone who helps you uh, who helps you understand how to regulate your emotions when you're at an older age um, and who introduces you and exposes you to other to other things to try out uh, to achieve that. The next one is titled Men Slash Society Sigh. Yesterday, my daughter, age 12, started high school. Instead of being driven to school, she now catches a bus and walks 15 minutes from the main road into our subdivision to get home. It's New Zealand. It's generally pretty chill. However, literally on her very first day of walking home in her school uniform, a guy in his 30s, a tradie who was working on a new house, yelled out to her asking how was school, etc. He stopped what he was doing, crossed the street and continued to ask her what she was up to. She was incredibly uncomfortable and just kept walking. The guy was 100% hitting on a 12-year-old. He may have wrongly assumed that she was at the higher age of high school, 18, but that's still not okay. I had already told her that she isn't able to wear headphones while walking alone, and after this encounter, she said, I now understand the whole needing to be alert thing. I hate this so much. I hate that my child can't even walk 200 meters from her home without being harassed by some perv. It was day one. 
For what it's worth, she's now going to have her phone in her hand at all times on the walk and video call me if she ever feels the tiniest bit uncomfortable. Thankfully, from tomorrow, there will be a larger group for her to walk with too. But to the debate, how as a society do we get men to not approach women and children? How can we get men to understand that this BS is intimidating and scary? Why are we still having to raise our daughters to be on high alert in areas they should feel safe? Now, what I really, really deeply hate about this is the generalization, right? You have one experience with someone who may be a creep. He may have been someone with terrible social uh, awareness and thought that he was just making conversation with a child and that it would be lighthearted and fun. And yeah, like that's a terrible assumption to make if you're an older guy and you're talking to a, to a school age girl, like that's not, that's not a good assumption. You should probably avoid that, putting yourself in that situation in the same way that if you're a guy, don't hang out like a kid's playground, uh, no matter what, like, I'm sorry, I know it's maybe not fair, but uh, there's nothing that you can do as a man that will make you not look like a creep in terms of how you deal with that situation, even if it's perfectly innocent, even if you're waiting for your wife, uh, it people people will notice and people will look at you funny. So yes, uh, even if this is completely innocent, I don't think that the guy should have done this. And I think it's fair enough for her to be creeped out by it. And especially as a 12 year old girl, you are very, very, very vulnerable. If you're a child in general, you're pretty damn vulnerable. And so even if it's a short walk from school to home, uh, I would always be hyper vigilant in these uh, in these circumstances. I think that that's a good thing to teach your kids because you cannot trust people and kids get kidnapped all the time and it sucks. Obviously, it's one of the most uh, tragic things that can possibly happen. What I really hate still, despite all of that, is this idea of, okay, this is a societal problem that we as a society have made it somehow acceptable for men to creep on little little children. I don't think that this is true at all. I think based on the fact that I just said, hey, everyone, everyone would consider any man 30 plus, 40 plus years old, hanging around a playground, hanging around a school, talking to a, to a little girl like this, any of these circumstances, I'm pretty sure 100% of people would notice that and would, would side eye it a little bit and would be like, I don't know what's going on here, but I don't feel safe and I don't think this is good. And I bet you that under a lot of circumstances, those men would get reported as well, which says to me that actually as a society, we're not accepting of this behavior at all. And uh, I know I like I hate to be cliche here, but not all men. Uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of men that I know would not put themselves in this position, would not would not be trying to make conversation with a 12 year old, even if, again, even if it is just a totally innocent conversation, which to me, it sounds like uh, when he asks, how was school? It doesn't sound like he was trying to be a total creep, but who knows? Who knows, right? I don't know the rest of the situation. I find it also a bit strange that she uh, is able to say things like he's in his 30s. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I could never guess how old adults were. Uh, they were always just like some some age up there. Uh, and so it seems to me, and also when she says he was 100% hitting on her, seems to me that the mother at least is at least not super open about the full breadth of the conversation that they had there and what happened because i would not have this level of conviction uh, i would have still told my 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 daughter to be super careful and to watch out and keep her phone with her and to have an easy time calling people and make it really fast for her to call someone if she needs to no i would have had this conversation anyway i think uh, irrespective of this particular encounter and so yeah i think it's a it's a shame I feel a little bit a little bit bad for any men out there who who, who are not creeps, uh, who don't put themselves in these positions. And I don't think this this point of like how do we get men to not approach women and children? Like there are some circumstances in which men should approach women, uh, definitely, and there are probably some circumstances in which men should probably approach a child as well. For example, if you notice a lost child who seems to be wandering around and not like not find has no idea where they are, then I would hope that any reasonable, responsible adult will go to that child and be like, hey, are you okay? Uh, and, and try to help them. So there are situations in which this should not be behavior that we discourage from men across the board. And the pretense that it's always going to be abusive in some way, it's always going to be harmful in some ways, is, is kind of like as an assumption, that's a pretty harmful one to have. Why are we still having to raise our daughters to be on high alert in areas they should feel safe? I don't think that daughters should feel safe pretty much anywhere except like in your house or uh, if they're around like their dad, for example. Uh, 
let's say it like this you're the only person who's ever going to be responsible for your safety and it's not a bad thing to teach kids that they should be vigilant that they should keep an eye out um and women should do this as well and men should do this as well like when you are whenever you're in a situation where you might be vulnerable for some reason you're the only person who's going to look after yourself like your first responsibility is to look after yourself and you cannot rely on bystanders or on anyone else around you to save you if uh if need be and so i don't think that I don't think it's a bad thing to teach kids to be on high alert uh, when they are in situations that are vulnerable. And sorry, if you're walking by yourself as a child uh, in a city of some kind, then you're, you're probably pretty, pretty vulnerable. So I think it's a shame that we have arrived at this point where we just say, yeah, men. Uh, and I hope that that, uh, that that does not spiral out of control uh, for us as a society. Now, the first person says here, I would have had her call the police. And obviously people call her out on this. Like, yeah, what, what would you say to the police? This man is talking to me. Um, so one person here says, talking to someone in public isn't a crime. I don't know what the technical standard is for harassment where OP lives, but I don't think this would rise to that where I live unless he was being specifically obscene in some way. And another person replies to her saying, it's not a crime to talk to someone in public, but the fact that this man is still trying to engage the other person in an unwanted conversation is considered harassment. If I were her, I would tell him to back off or the police will be called or call the police, no questions asked. Now, I think this is completely extreme and insane. And the idea of calling the police on, on someone for saying two sentences to you or asking you two questions is kind of out there. I, I, like I said, I don't know if there's context that's missing here. I don't know if he said anything obscene to her. I don't know if he like leered at her or wolf whistled or gave some kind of indication that there was something sexual there. But, um, you know, I, w I was also a kid once and I also had to go quite a long way to school. And I also had random men sometimes sit next to me or talk to me or ask me questions. And yeah, it's creepy and you feel uncomfortable because you're like, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want from me. I don't really want to talk to you. Uh, but calling the police as your first response is a little bit intense. And I'm pretty sure that in the majority of situations, I mean, if you're a 12 year old girl, you're never going to stand up and say, hey, uh, I'm really uncomfortable now, please go away. Like that's, uh, that's highly unlikely that any girl will say that and you don't really want to get in someone's face. If you do think that there's something iffy about them, you just want to try and get out of the situation as quietly and as calmly as possible. So people and their terrible advice, man. Uh, the next one here says, first of all, I'm so sorry your daughter had to experience this. I would want to find out who this man is and report him for being a predator. This is absolutely unacceptable behavior. And I'm disgusted that in this day and age, girls and women still have to tolerate this lewd behavior. One answer to your question is to raise boys who understand that this is unacceptable and who have respect of all people and their boundaries. Boys who understand that women aren't put on this planet for their pleasure and entertainment. But since there are millions of men who were not raised this way, teaching girls and women to protect and defend themselves is really the only option at this point. It is smart to have her walk with a group and carry her phone so that she can call you or the police quickly. If she can get a picture of him, it might be helpful to talk to, to take to the police so they can convince him to stop harassing young girls. Just a thought. Oh my god. Now, you know, the, the the sad thing is, I actually agree with most of what she says. Like, yes, it's, uh, it's unacceptable for men to hit on 12-year-old girls. Uh, yes, we should raise boys who understand that it's not okay and who should have respect for other people's boundaries. And this idea of boys who understand that women aren't put on this planet for their pleasure and entertainment. I honestly don't believe that this is something that you need to teach the vast majority of, of boys. Like, I also... Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm assuming. Maybe I'm assuming here that uh, that most men are actually quite reasonable men and and don't see women in this way. But okay, uh, I will give her that. I agree with all of this. I just think that this is such an extreme response based on what OP says in her thread, which you know he came up to her and he was like, "Hey, how was school?" Like. I, I just, I don't think that that's, that that's lewd. I, I don't think the be, you know, the behavior doesn't seem to me overly sexual. Um, I don't know if I'm just a little bit too hesitant here to assign blame or to assign intentions, uh, based on what the mother has said, but I just find the, the things that she said were not explicit enough or not direct enough that I think you can take the situation and say, okay, no, it wasn't just a random, uh, a random encounter where he thought that he was being, you know, nice or neighborly or, or something along those lines. Um, so yeah, in general, it's definitely good to avoid 12 year old girls if you are a man, uh, unfortunately for you. And I say unfortunately for you, but in general, it just, it makes you look dodgy. It makes you look dodgy. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't do it. 
And maybe, maybe we shouldn't generalize a single creepy encounter to all men. The next one is titled, Husband bought a laptop after I told him not to. I am so mad at my husband. He bought a gaming laptop about a year ago and it died. It stopped working. He took it to get, to get it fixed and they couldn't fix it. Anyway, backstory. I hated that damn laptop because I found a bunch of porn slash anime on it once accidentally because I was using it for work and had to save a file and saw all the porn. I was disgusted and I confronted him about it. Anyway, a few weeks ago, he was telling me he wanted a new laptop because his old one couldn't get fixed. I told him no because we spent a bunch of money remodeling our kitchen and doing other stuff around the house. Also, we've been kind of searching for a new car because I need a bigger car because I am pregnant and need room for a car seat. I've been trying to hold off buying a new vehicle because I want to save a little more money until I do. Anyway, he wouldn't stop talking about the laptop. And I told him if anyone needs a laptop, it's me because of this new position I'm going into since I need it, uh, since I need to do it on a laptop. I haven't had a laptop in years. Also, I told him he had an Xbox he can play video games on, but he's about to be a dad and he needs to grow out of it. He then said, okay, I'll get you a laptop. And I told him I didn't want one, but he kept insisting. So I thought, okay, at least it's cheaper. And he gets 750 back from his job as a yearly budget to buy electronics. If he chose them a receipt and ultimately the laptop would cost about a hundred. Well, turns out a laptop got delivered today and it's a gaming laptop that's over 2K. He was like, my laptop arrived. And I was like, WTF? And he said, he bought each of us one. I was so mad and still am. He went behind my back. He said, oh, I bought it up and told you I didn't pay the full amount and that he'll pay like a hundred a month only. Oh my God, I can't believe him. He's purchasing a laptop on credit, something I didn't agree on, did it in a sneaky way and basically disregarded all the other priorities that we need a bigger car, that we need to set up a nursery. And don't get me wrong, we have money in the bank and we still have savings, but I just don't think he's responsible. I need more money in our savings uh, account and especially with big expenses coming up and a child. Two reasons I didn't want him to get a laptop is they are expensive and also I don't want him watching that much porn since he has had ED uh, in the past because of it. It was a struggle. Also, he doesn't use the laptop for anything else, only video games and maybe to do our taxes once a year. I'm furious. I was so mad I couldn't contain myself. I told him, okay, do whatever the F you want because you're making decisions on your own and my opinion doesn't matter. And I told him that he isn't coming to my first ultrasound. I literally feel rage right now. I don't know what to do. I think my husband seriously has an addiction. It's not even the games he plays because he doesn't play often, but it's the porn that I'm so worried about. We had major problems in the past. He would go soft during sex and had ED. I will talk to him when I calm down, but if anyone has advice, please share it. <sighs> now, you know, you can always tell the way that people, you can tell a lot from the way that people express themselves. And the way that she says here, husband bought a laptop after I told him not to. That already kind of highlights a big part of the problem in your marriage, in your relationship. Uh, I don't think that you engage or interact with people who you consider to be your equals. Uh, in this type of way where you just tell them to do something or you tell them not to do something. That's not how that works. Uh, you make decisions about your finances together. Clearly in this situation, you should be making the decision together. And uh, then the rest of the way, she kind of really misrepresents the argument because she said, hey, I don't like, don't get the laptop. And then she's like, well, I need a laptop. And he's like, okay, I'll get you one then. And she's like, fine, because of all of these other reasons. And then he goes and he spends more on the laptop than she wanted him to. Instead of sitting down and going, okay, what can we afford? How much can we really pay? What type of laptop uh, is reasonable? What type of laptop is not reasonable? And then she also doesn't seem to address the actual primary problem. And her primary problem isn't so much the laptop expense because she says they have money and they have uh, uh, they have savings and so on. Although she does say she wants to save up more and they have bigger expenses coming up, but she's not she's not very clear about that. It just seems to me like she's throwing a lot uh, in there. So it's probably not the money. It's probably not even the gaming. Although her comment about that was also totally unreasonable, where she's like, yeah, you, you, you need to outgrow that. <laughs> How dare you have hobbies as a dad? You're not allowed to. But the porn. Her problem is the porn. And instead of sitting down and having that conversation about the porn, she just completely blew up about everything else. And that's not helpful. Obviously, that's not cool. I say that, and I also don't think that his behavior here is acceptable either. I don't think that you should be going behind your wife's back and buying a $2,000 uh, laptop or whatever it is you spent. 
I think it's unreasonable. Like clearly they had a conflict about this. I don't think that the way that you make financial decisions as a couple is that one person says, I want to buy X and the other person says, no, I think you should have some kind of, ideally, uh, some kind of budget together where you're able, or in general, that you're able to just sit down and decide on expenses together, that he should also know how much they need to be saving up for a new car, that he should know how much they need for the car seat, that he should know how much savings they have and so on, and be able to make these decisions together. But... Given all of that, I think he behaves like a child uh, and yes, making decisions unilaterally in a marriage is terrible. And I think she seems to be terrible at communication because she just lobbed everything that she had into this issue instead of saying, this is the primary problem that I have with you. Um, and if you're angry about something like a laptop because of porn, that's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit dodgy to me, to be honest. Uh, you can watch porn in lots of different ways. You do not need a gaming laptop to watch porn on it so that she jumped to this as the primary concern says to me that there's something there's something iffy and something weird about this uh if the issue is the money aspect then she would have focused on the money aspect if the issue is the porn aspect then she should have focused on the porn aspect and if it is actually gaming that is the problem then she should have had a conversation with him about how much he was gaming but trying to pretend that all three are super important and vitally important at the same time and this is why she's furious is just just seems disingenuous it seems insincere and it doesn't seem right now she did an update afterwards she says i just talked to him and he said he brought it up and i didn't say anything this was after i told him i didn't want him buying it and i just remember saying no and i probably didn't want to talk about it anymore so i ignored him the third day he brought it up and he used that as a green light I told him that the issue is the porn and not the video games and he said he would return the laptop and that he mainly wanted to use it for video games because he has years worth of them on an app called Steam. He then said, or I can just leave it at work and play at work when he has time. He works nights and when it's super slow, I guess he plays video games. At least I know he won't be watching porn at work since he works with people and that would be too, so immoral. He said he loves me and that he hasn't been watching porn that much and that our marriage and baby is his priority, but that playing video games is something he does to relax. I told him he didn't have to return it, but to leave it at work and not bring it home so at the very least they did manage to talk it out and come up with some kind of solution uh i find this way the, the way that they just communicate with each other kind of hilarious here so he brought it up she said no he brought it up again she was like annoyed i guess and she probably also still said no and then he brought it up the third time and she just ignored him and he was like oh, okay that that means that i can buy the laptop Oh uh, my god. Okay, so yeah, that's not that's that's it. Just don't do things like this. Honestly, you can save yourself so much time. Uh, I appreciate that they managed to find some kind of compromise that allowed him to still have time playing video games, I guess, and that she kind of got over this whole thing where as a dad you're not allowed you're not allowed to 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 game. Uh, one comment here that does kind of illuminate a little bit this idea of buying a gaming laptop for porn. Uh, this person says, why would he need a laptop for porn though? He could just watch it on his phone. If he's watching porn, he'll find a way regardless of having a laptop or not. And uh, OP says they have these games that you can buy that are porn. Uh, and she, then she goes, I know it's pretty disgusting to me. And yeah, that's, that's a little bit dodgy, although I'm pretty sure you don't need a gaming laptop for those games either. But hey, uh, hey, what do I know? So in general, uh, maybe do not make decisions like this. And dear women, I think you uh, overwhelm men. And you like there's this there's this part where a lot of women do this thing where they treat their men as if they're children and you talk down on them and you, you, you're kind of too much of a mother. And this dynamic here really comes through here where you just you can't be bothered interacting or engaging with him as though you are both equals who have an equal say in your marriage. And that's not healthy and that's uh, that's also not good. And I think it in many ways is emasculating for the man. And that's a big part of why when they don't feel respected, then they go ahead and do whatever the F they want anyway, because they're grown adult men and they can also make their own decisions. So that's not good. The next one is titled husband didn't get me anything for Valentine's Day. What is your take on Valentine's Day? I didn't think I'd be upset, but I am. And he came home late from work. I'm pregnant with baby number two and a stay at home mom. I didn't need anything huge, but even flowers picked from the side of the road or a small candy bar would have been nice. I took my son on a walk to the store to get my husband some balloons, a nice card and his favorite goodies. Since having our firstborn, who is now two, I've mentioned to him multiple times now. I feel it as if at times our relationship lacks romance and at times I feel unappreciated as a stay-at-home mom because of it and feel as if I'm just there. He's a wonderful father and husband, but I just felt unappreciated today. How do you do Valentine's Day? Would you be upset? Can't tell if it's just pregnancy hormones and I'm overreacting or what? I also got into an argument with my sister today, which may be adding to my frustrations. 
Ah, now, I think that all of these days, so everything from birthday to Valentine's Day to Mother's Day to your anniversary, I think having the set of days that you try and celebrate together as a couple is, is cute. Uh, I think that if people probably invested the time in doing something for them, it's, it's not bad for your relationship and it's not bad for your uh, for your marriage in general. So I kind of understand why she's a little bit bummed. But honestly, uh, like we don't care, for example, about Valentine's Day. That's not a thing that we celebrate. Uh, we don't celebrate very much uh, together, to be honest. But also we don't have this problem of feeling unappreciated. And so if the fundamental problem in your marriage is just you don't feel appreciated, then I don't think that's ever going to be solved with like some token flowers or some token chocolate that you get on Valentine's Day. I think that there's a much deeper issue there that you should be trying to work on. And so it's easy from like from the woman's side that, hey, you want to be to feel special. Uh, so you, you want your husband to kind of go out of his way to remember these things, to buy you amazing gifts, um, to make you feel to make you feel appreciated and valued. Uh, I think that's all super sweet. And I would encourage all men to do that if you want to keep your, your marriages in a good place and to keep your wives happy. Uh, but I also think that as wives, we kind of spent a lot of time with one leg back. Uh, so we spend ages kind of waiting, uh, waiting for the other person to take a step forward instead of trying to solve these problems ourselves. And if you do have this kind of situation where you're like, yeah, you know what, I just I don't feel very appreciated. I feel like I'm not I'm not spending enough time uh, on our marriage. Then, you know, you can always organize something yourself. You can always try and uh, you, you can you can plan the surprise. Uh, you don't need to wait for the husband to do it. And maybe it's not fair for something like Valentine's Day. I don't know. Although I would consider that Valentine's Day is pretty equal on both sides. But uh, but it makes life so much easier when you don't spend all of your time on this uh, on this passive level. Are you waiting for the other person to meet the needs that you have and the needs that you have articulated? Uh, so, you know, it would have been nice for him to do it. But uh, life happens and one of the hard one of the hard things about keeping a marriage going is still finding time to invest in all of these other things that and invest in the romance i guess and to invest in all of the things that made your that made your marriage feel special now, some of the comments, I didn't get anything either. I thought I'd be okay with it, and I'm not. We went to the grocery store to buy steak for our dinner, and he joked about all the men lined up to buy flowers. I was like, wow, at least they care. It's sweet. I got him some customized cookies, super cute, but nothing huge. I realize I'm triggered from my past of always having to accept and be okay with not being considered during days like this. Also, from needing to push down my feelings of disappointment so that someone else can feel comfortable with their decision not to think of me. It's more about me and my feelings, but anything would have been nice. Now, that, just the comment there of him laughing at the other men who are lined up to buy flowers like oh my god cringe uh, don't do that don't do that that's not nice like that's pretty much picking a fight look at all these other people who can be bothered buying buying flowers for their girlfriends and for their wives and like i can't uh, it sounds like you feel unappreciated in general. Do you guys uh, typically recognize Valentine's Day and he just didn't today? In your shoes, I would have a conversation about the lack of gratitude in the relationship. Don't make it about Valentine's Day because then you'll just get the obligatory flowers every year going forward. And I can't imagine that that would make you any happier. Perhaps a change in the entire dynamic is in order. And OP replies, she says, I usually recognize Valentine's Day and will get him something, but he usually forgets. I agree. I think I'm just feeling unappreciated in general. I feel a huge part of it is being a stay-at-home mom. And now I'm pregnant with number two. I feel as if I'm constantly taking care of everyone else and their needs that I just feel easily forgotten. You're right. I will probably have a much needed conversation about it tonight. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I think that this is pretty much a lot of people look for problems in these small things that are actually pretty fundamental problems in their relationship. And instead of dealing with the fundamental problem in the relationship, it's kind of easy to try and blame it on Valentine's Day or to try and blame it on your anniversary. And you're like, well, he didn't get me anything for the anniversary, so that's the problem. But actually, if you're pretty happy in your marriage and in your relationship, then none of these things, none of these gestures are all that important because your foundation is already strong enough. And so um, I would definitely think that both both parties should still try to invest in their marriage and in their relationships over a longer period of time because 
once you once it's been like 10 years and you're all settled down and everything is is kind of boring and simple and you have your routines then you forget you forget to interact with each other on a, on on the level that you used to interact with each other on and uh, and that's that's a shame that's quite sad so yes uh, maybe worth doing something for valentine's day if you have the opportunity to do it but honestly if you have other problems in your marriage you should sort those out first that's all we've got time for today. Feel free to like the video or leave a comment if you agreed or disagreed with anything that I said here. And um, you can subscribe for future content. I will see you in the next one.